There is a lot of complexity that comes with a second marriage, especially if you had kids from the previous marriages. When you go to get married and that combine those assets together, that can be tricky. It can be tricky financially, it can be tricky emotionally, and it can be, it can be challenging philosophically. On Consider This Program today, we're going to break down what that means for you, some of the things that we have seen, and some of the things that we might consider you um, just thinking about. Join us on Consider This Program. Well, good morning and welcome to Consider This Program. I am your host, Joe Clark. And I'm Aaron Rayum. And we are happy to have you along. Thank you for taking the time. We know there's many things you could be doing with your time right now, as opposed to listening to Aaron and I discuss finance. We are glad you're here. Um, we're, we commend you for taking the time to try to learn more about the crazy financial world that we're in. Aaron is the Director of Financial Planning at the Financial Enhancement Group. He's one of our partners and a dear friend of mine and happy to have you along, Aaron. Thank you, Joe. Um, the theme of this whole show, there's four segments involved, and if you didn't get to hear them all um, on uh, WIBC and a few other places, you're limited to three. Uh, but if you would like to, you can go to our website at yourlifeafterwork.com. And you have access to all four of those segments. You can even watch the video if you like pictures. Um, it comes on a YouTube or Vimeo stream, one or the other, where you have the ability to be able to watch it uh, and go from there. But the, the title of the overall topic is When Things Change. Um, and they come very, very quickly. This one is about the second marriage and the combination of assets. And you could even take that when it's your first marriage, but, but perhaps it's your spouse's second marriage. How do you bring those assets in together? So, Aaron, I'm going to turn this over to you and let you drive, as you like to call it. Okay. Right? Take me where you want to go, and, and what, what, what's the first thing that you would tell a family that's getting married, um, and they've got kids, each from a separate marriage, and now they're coming together? What do they think about? What do they do? Yeah. I mean, it, we go back to bringing people through a journey, and the same journey that you go on through retirement planning has to mold together in your relationship. And so some families want to combine assets, some want to keep them separate. And it's really just having a detailed conversation with the individuals that are sitting across the table from us and figuring out what they want the assets to do. Some want them to go directly to their kids and not to stepkids. And so we want to help guide them in any way that we can. But you know, help them lead the direction of that conversation as well. So what I'm hearing you say is there's not necessarily a right answer. No. Okay. And we've seen it done multiple ways. Yeah. Right. Um, so one of the things that I'm uh, accustomed to seeing mm -hmm. um, when people first get married, right, especially if they have kids from a second mar from the first marriage uh, and there's sizable assets, um, is what ha what happens is that people tend to say when I when I'm gone. I want it to go directly to my kids. Yes. Right? And what happens 10 years later is I still want it to go to my kids, but I don't want to leave my spouse in a lurch if I'm to pass away. Mm -hmm. Right? And so we help them work with an estate planning attorney where we're able to create trust and documents uh, where the money will ultimately go to the kids. Right? Um, but in the meantime, income can come off of that asset to be able to provide the other spouse. Yes. Right? Another one is the house. This is a common question, right? Mm -hmm. So I own the house. Something happens to Barb. Let's go the other way. Um, Barb owns the house. Something happens to me. I don't like that idea either. <laughs> There's no way I like this picture, Kill frankly. Okay, Aaron dies. Um, <laughs> right? No, just kidding. If something happens to one of the people who yeah. owns the house. And, and and I can put this in my own in, in my own world. Um, you know, when my, my mother lives in Sarasota with my stepfather, my dad passed away, his wife passed away. You know, they're down in Florida in a house in Sarasota. Um, he has resources. We never had resources. And it's his house, right? Mm -hmm. And his kids, like everybody else, I think probably would, because money makes people think strangely. Very uh, much was so. very worried that my brother and I would end up with the money from the house because my stepfather is really? older. Oh, yes. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like, um, I, I think you'll, I think, but, but I understand I understand the attitude and the behavior, right, of, of terms of what happened. And where it was originally set up is if something happened to him, the house did indeed go to the kids. Mom got a little bit of money, but she had to disperse, mm -hmm. right? Now, over the period of time, it's changed to where mom's allowed to stay in the house as long as she's allowed to live, okay? Um, and and I'm, I'm trying to get you here to something that I think is important. Um, mom's allowed to stay in the house as long as she's alive, 
and then it goes back to her, his two boys, not to my brother and I. So, which, she, so she wouldn't be kind of pushed out of the house. Correct. Some, okay. Now here's the problem. Okay. Right. And this is one of the things people forget financially with this combination of assets. There's two things that get missed. Um, that are that you that you, sometimes you have to talk for half an hour to be able to get people to open up to understand this. But there's mm-hmm. two major conversations. The first one is houses have these cute little things called carry costs, mm-hmm. right? When you leave a half a million dollar house to somebody who has no money, right? They have no ability to provide the lawn care that's been done taxes. To, Maybe to, pay, maybe to pay the taxes, maybe to take care of the roof or the water heater or to do the upkeep. So, so you've got a couple things right here working, right? You could have a bad apple. You could have a bad player, mm-hmm. right? Maybe she didn't like my stepbrothers, right? Now, that's not the case, but maybe she didn't like them. And she has no interest, even if she has the money, in keeping the house up because she's not going to get it and she's saving more money for my brother and I, right? Yeah. Or in this case, she literally wouldn't have the money to be able to take care of it like he has, mm-hmm. right? So you've got to pay attention to carry cost. I wrote an article on that uh, probably a month or two ago. If you would like to get it, uh, we write an article weekly that goes into the Herald Bulletin. Aaron actually co-authored one with me here recently. Um, but you can go to our website at yourlifeafterwork.com and just request it. I can send that to you, but it explains that as one of the problems. The second one, so Aaron, you can keep your assets separate from Jess. Now they're a first time marriage, three kids. This is not an issue. But let's say they were combining their assets. It was second marriage and they had kids from the previous marriage. They you you can choose. And there's there I, I won't tell you what's right or wrong, mm-hmm. right? Um, Lord knows we've seen them both. We've taught people how to do both that wanted to do that, where here's how you separate yours. I've got a family where we do the family up. Actually, we have multiple families now where I do the family update for one of them and somebody else on the team does the family update for the ex-spouse, right? Mm-hmm. And I do the family update for one of the spouses in Lafayette and one of the other planners in Lafayette, Dean, does the family update for the other spouse. That's yeah. how far they keep their money separate. Now, I'm a, a, you know, I'm a little pragmatic about this, so I, I scratch my head and I go, I, yeah, I've, never, I've never been in a second marriage. I've never had the issue as close to, as close to my life as I can come of kids arguing over money. Is my step, you know, and yeah. they're over that. You know, this is, we're 20 years into this gig. They figured it out. You know, John and I are going to be okay. You know, we don't want the house. I don't want to live in Florida. You know, I, I'm going to visit my mom, but other than that, get me out. Right? Yep. I'm, I'm a Hoosier. I'm staying here. Um, regardless of what you do. There is no way, Aaron, to get around the fact that you should file married jointly, right? Which means in your investment account, what you do does impact Jess's taxes. Absolutely. Right? And, um, you know, so people forget that. And so I will have, I will be in my review or my family update with one spouse and I help them do a Roth conversion. That means they're going to pay taxes today, right? But they're going to have tax-free money later on, Mm -hmm. right? But the guy in the other room's doing the update. And the, uh, the other spouse says, I don't want to do a Roth conversion. I don't want to pay taxes today. Who would want to pay taxes today, right? And so Dean will talk until he's blue in the face to try to explain, just like I would, that this is why you need to do it. But inevitably, that person says no. But the tax return is going to come together, and the guy in the other room is going to pay taxes too, mm-hmm. right? So the only way that we've ever gotten around this, and this is why I work with CPA people, is that the best case solution is that you actually do two individual tax returns. You file separately for the return purposes, so you can see what your liability is. We can see what Jess's liability is. You pay your portion. She pays her portion. It goes into a kitty. Then we file a joint return. Whatever's owed is less than what you both were able to put in together. You get back the percentage of how much ever it's reduced by. She gets back the percentage. Everybody goes home happy, and you could do a Roth conversion. She didn't, and everybody's good. So there you go. That's, uh, you know, that's, that's the best combining of strategies I've got. That is amazing, and I think we need to have a little bit more conversation with the other lady getting her to do the conversion. I, <laughs> absolutely. This, it was a guy, yeah. by the way. Oh, the so guy. The, yeah. lady, the lady said, absolutely. Okay. She, I mean, she got it. This time the guy, oh, no. yeah. who, who would want to pay taxes today, right? Yep. So what else is there that they should consider in combining the assets? Think about from your, from your banking days. Can I ask you a question? I mean, sure. so is this a time where maybe silo investing comes in? In, a, in the household? Um, very much so. So silo investing is when, when you look at one particular asset, one particular account, as opposed to looking at a farm operation, mm-hmm. all of the things that are there. So 
would you want to do that if you're keeping things separate or you would... you have to so so let's say you make fifty thousand dollars a year and the person that you married makes two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year you can no longer make a roth contribution mm-hmm. because your joint agi is now too high right. right may have been a critical part of your planning that you don't get to do um, getting married whether you combine assets or not changes the way that you want to be able to function it changes what you're able to deduct it changes all sorts of things in terms of, of how how all of this all rolls out together. So I understand the idea of trying to keep assets separate. Mm-hmm. Um, there is a list of philosophies that I would discuss with people. If you think back to before you and Jess got married, right? I'm thinking today, you probably have questions you didn't ask her today that you would ask now. Absolutely. Right? There are certainly questions I would have asked Barb. Now, that doesn't mean I would have changed my mind, mm-hmm. right? But there are philosophies that we would have laid out. I think people typically ask the question, um, you know, uh, where are we going to live? How many kids do you want to have? Or do you want to have kids, right? Yep. Um, every now and then I see somebody that talks about debt, right? Because remember, when you get married, you are, Marrying for intensive debt. purposes, taking on at least the expenditure. You may not be contractually obligated to the debt, but the income is going to go to help cover whatever that debt is. Very rarely do people talk about the saving strategy, right? And so if you've been if you've been saving money your whole life, and all of a sudden you marry somebody who wants to go to Vegas all the time or, and you know, not casting judgment, just trying to show you the difference. Somebody who doesn't think about the future, doesn't think about retirement, doesn't think about saving, doesn't think about investing, doesn't care about it. You can be walking yourself into a, a nightmare, mm-hmm. right? Um, if you've never had debt in your life and suddenly the other person has three credit cards, you might ask why, yes. right? I have three, but I got companies. And I've got personal. Yeah. Um, you know, that doesn't mean we have three that we go out willy nilly and, and use to, here's a great idea, right? Yep. Um, I, I, heard a, I heard an expression today, and then we'll end this, that said, you know you're rich when you care more about saving than spending. Now, <laughs> I'm not sure I agree with this in entirety yet, but I am playing with it in my head. I thought, you know, the, one of the podcasts I was listening to this morning, you know you're rich when you care more about saving than you do about spending. And I know that exemplifies an awful lot of the families I take care of. Um, just not sure. I, I got to work with it a little bit. Sure. Got to, got to, got to ponder, right? But you know, a little bit, a little bit of pontification. Hey, 800-928-4001. Give us a call. Yourlifeafterwork.com.